staff the meeting. Uh, item one, apologies for absence, and apologies from Councillor Rutkin, who's unwell, everyone else is here. Item two, minutes of the previous meeting, can we agree those? Agreed. Item three, to confirm our very order of business, I propose we keep the uh, order of business as on the agenda. Item four, are there any declarations of interest? No? Okay. If we then move on to item five, which is like a plan. Yes, just in case, um, I might have to declare interest as an employee of Ipswich School, and I believe it's mentioned in, in this plan. Not many places are mentioned in yeah, Indeed. It does. <laughs> uh, I do receive a pecuniary interest, so. <coughs> Uh, if it is a pecuniary, then you probably have to leave for... Does it arise out of the Northern Fringe or out of some other thing? Is there any other thing? Uh, through you, Chair, I think given that this is about agreeing a report to go for consultation, uh, yeah. then it is okay for Council of Mydeck to remain in the room. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, item <coughs> five then, it's just like plan, call, strategy, etc. Uh, Councillor Jones, uh, just before um, Councillor Jones speaks, we have got some revised recommendations. Can I just check everybody's received those? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jones. Got here a very um, large paper, but it has um, been to us uh, before in a in a similar though not identical form. Um, its history is this: the uh, briefly the inspection of the previous administration's local plan, 2011, found it sound, but required the council to carry out of a review of um, the core strategy and the site allocations policy. It's already, this document, um, been out to consultation once from January to March of this year uh, and Appendix 3 and Appendix 4 contain extensive representations, comments from our officers and suggested changes uh, to the plan with um, officer response. It's in two main parts, uh, you have uh, the core strategy and development policies outlined in section three of your report and then the site allocation papers which are described in section four. It is um, a substantial document so I'll highlight for uh, members some of the changes contained uh, within it. Now, um, some changes are because we've uh, merged policies to make them simpler to use. For example, uh, DM7 Public Art has been deleted altogether and become part of uh, DM5 Design and Character. And I think rephrased in a much more helpful way for probably officers and certainly for committee members. So um, for some policies there's been this useful streamlining that has led to um, improvements uh, for how usable those policies are. Some changes um, noted in the report uh, come as a result of the consultation that we undertook in, uh, earlier in the year. Um, uh, for example, the River Hill Gypsy and Traveller site, we have suggested that uh, for um, that purpose. We received <coughs> representations opposing that use and uh, we have um, removed it um, uh, as a result. 
But I would say most changes have occurred because of the simple need to update due to changes in national policy, mainly the um, introduction of the, uh, the coalition government's national planning policy framework, or because uh, we've updated our own evidence base, so to bring all that up to date, or because circumstances have changed. For example, uh, there was in the previous administration's plan the requirement to master plan the Northern Fringe sites. But we've removed that because we've done it, so it's no longer uh, pertinent. But, interestingly, key details of um, the document are now absorbed into uh, policy CS10, making it um, a stronger policy, uh, in my view. Um, another couple of changes, Chair, affordable housing. We had uh, consultants carry out a whole plan viability assessment in the light of changes to national policy. The NPPF gives greater weight to developers' viability arguments and as a result of this whole plan uh, assessment, we've had to lower our affordable housing requirements from at least 35% to at least uh, 15%. And I think this is um, obviously very disappointing. Uh, two points about that. It does highlight the importance of the council's own council house building program that helps in some way to make up for the shortfall and secondly, um, it is not uh, that 15% um, does not apply to the Ipswich Garden suburb um, because the same consultant um, carried out a viability assessment of, uh, of that site and that is still 35%. Uh, Sustainable construction is another um, regrettable change. Uh, in Policy DM1, we've had to change our requirement that developers move to sustainable homes levels 5 and 6 on large applications. We had a very good um, policy, I think, uh, which I remember Councillor Smart, uh, myself, and Councillor Martin drawing up. It was your baby and it was a good one because what it did was it brought in a phased improvement in sustainability requirements for developers and we've had to change uh, this now and this is primarily because we now think it will be undeliverable uh, partly because of developers viability arguments but also because next year the government plans to implement a review stating that no planning condition can require any developer to build beyond uh, level four and uh, that's a great disappointment. There are changes to town centre policies, IP1 policies in this uh, document. Town centres, as we're aware, have changed over the uh, past decade and everywhere will continue to change and the local plan reflects this. For example, in the light of the DTZ retail study, we recommend the allocation of a Westgate site for retail-led use, but with a recognition that throughout the IP1 area, the central area of Ipswich, we will expect uh, a wider mix of uses on our sites, including more residential uh, than we've had hitherto. And we, we can see that shift in um, the allocation of the eastern section of the Mint Quarter site, which is now residential, whereas in the past it had been uh, retail. The waterfront continues to be a focus for uh, regeneration, not only uh, for housing, although housing is clearly there, um, but our policy uh, states that we would support conference and exhibition uh, space there, and that I think is a very welcome aspiration. Um, site uh, 150C, the uh, Ravenswood land, um, a Ravenswood um, site uh, had been allocated for employment 
and uh, we we are keeping, we are retaining that as um, employment land because although we have it in it yet for employment, not, nonetheless, with an improved uh, in economy, we do think it's worthwhile retaining that uh, for the future. Uh, Chair, this is a consultation document. It, it's going to come back to members uh, before submission to the Secretary of State. We are proposing a consultation period of 12 weeks. That's actually double the mandatory six weeks. It begins on December the 12th, continues to March uh, the 5th. So there is ample time for anybody wishing uh, to comment on the uh, document to do so, and we welcome uh, their comments. There are three uh, errors, if you like, or uh, changes. I just, uh, you've uh, mentioned the changes to the recommendations, they've been tabled. Um, it's really because uh, simply states that it will need to go to council, to full council, this um, consultation paper. Two typographical errors, one on uh, the map, uh, the large map just before um, page 200. Uh, there, it's the local, it's the local plan policies map in the far northeastern corner. Uh, it's mentioned in the legend that that is allocated uh, as um, a sports park, uh, but a technical error in the GIS system meant it didn't uh, actually show it on the map and it's been reinstated now. And uh, policy DM 28, protection of amenity, page 147, para uh, 9. 160 is actually part of the policy and uh, should um, should be involved, should be represented as that. But everything else is as table chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Wish to add anything else? Um, just to, to uh, say this is really important, we um, take these two plans through to adoption. Uh, at present, the development plans made up of the adopted core strategy from 2011 and also some safe policies from the uh, old local plan. So in effect, these two documents would replace those two and become the new local plan. Um, it's also important to have these in place because it provides certainty over future direction of development in the borough, while being flexible enough to respond to market changes. Um, and there's also an aspiration to create in the region of 12,500 jobs um, to support the Council's economic development strategy by 2031. And through doing this, um, the Council is safeguarding a site 10 hectares of Petrua Park for um, big class uses, that is um, offices, industrial buildings and warehouses. So I'll have that, Chair. Yeah. No questions or comments? Can I Thank you, Chair. Uh, as Councillor Jones says, we're going to have ample opportunity to talk about this, so we'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go on in length. But I do have four or five questions. Do you want me to do them all in one go? Oh, can I just get a bang? Can we do them one at a time? One at a time. Okay, um, the first one is uh, we do not support a two-tier affordable housing programme, one that reduces affordable, affordable housing to 15% outside of the Ipswich Garden suburb, and we don't support 35% on the Ipswich Garden suburb. Um, can I ask if the consultation shows that people are not happy with that either, and perhaps we'd like to see it more at 25%, say, where that would bring 600 more social housing, would we change our policy or are we going to stick to what we've got in the policy? That's the first one. Okay, Mr Holt. Yeah. Uh, Mr Holt. Yep. Okay, I mean the affordable need is above 35% still. Um, the reason it's being lowered is because of the whole plan viability work which said that um, sites over 15% outside of the garden suburb would not be viable for affordable housing. So that's the reason why it's being lowered. I knew like been lowered. The question is, would we change it if um, consultation shows that they agree with the Conservative group's stance on this? So I'm not quite clear what you're proposing, that we raise 
it's 25% outside of the no, Northern just Fringe. A flat, just a flat rate right across. Despite the fact we've got a viability study that says that if we insist on 25% outside the Northern Fringe, then it won't get built. Yeah, well, other towns have got 40%, 30%, so I don't see why we should be flat nailed. I'm surprised that this administration, because I know how passionate you are about it. Uh, Chair, may I? That would give us um, 600, at least 600 more houses if we had a flat rate right across the board. <laughs> I'm, Mr. I'm, Mr. I'm Mr. Hobbs, do you, do you want to explain the viability assessment that has been undertaken? That would be useful. Um, the viability assessment will be published alongside the consultation as a um, form of evidence base. Um, different areas have different land values. Land values in Ipswich are low, so that's why the 15% is there. I, mean, I take your point about the 25%, and it's um, disappointing that. 15% is what the viability study is saying, but the danger is if we say 25% and go to examination, the plan could be found unsound on the basis that 25% is not deliverable. I don't understand why it is on the Ipswich Garden suburb and, and, and as high as 35%. Because on the Ipswich Garden suburb it's currently farmland and it's got a low resisting use value, and also because it's in the higher value area of the borough, the um, revenues to be received would be higher. Okay, all right. I'll take that back. Thank you. Chair, are we discussing that point or we'll come back on that one later? Should we, should we get Councillor Chenchi's questions out of the way first and then we can come back on them? Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, we support the contraction of the town centre from the east, but we also believe it should include the west. And again, it's going against a report, but we should be doing what we think is right. Um, and we feel that the centre part should be you know, nice and simple and attractive and smaller because of internet shopping and other things, it would be much better if it was residential on both sides with leisure. People are crying out for leisure in the town centre. And then you get that footfall, naturally, from residential areas going into the town centre. So again, I think we should just disregard um, what has been said. We, are, we feel quite passionately about this. And, and I just don't see a shop ending up in the Westgate area either. So again, if the consultation shows that people agree with that, are we willing to change the core strategy? Chair, Chair, I would just say, you know, any local authority, any executive gets expert consultations and has to rely on what can be demonstrably shown to be a reliable evidence base. Six people saying what they'd like somewhere in the town centre does not form a reliable evidence base. Well, in, our, in our position, you would have commissioned a report, mm -hmm. you would have considered it, and because it is, uh, you know, a report by experts, you would have, and you have done, when you were in power, accepted it because that is the sensible and reliable thing to do. If we could begin from the beginning, now that people are into internet shopping and what we want is a very little town centre with all the shops where we want them uh, and the shops selling the things that we want, then we'd all have that, wouldn't we? We'd wave a magic wand and we'd have it, but we don't. What we have is a town centre in transition uh, town centres have always changed and this is no different now and we are doing our best using planning policies to deal with that transition. Okay, My question you, has, yeah, hasn't been answered but I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I can see that the tone is one that I find quite patronising and so I'm going to leave it for when we have a full debate. However, we won't be moving on this because it's not a magic wand. It's quite feasible to have a, a smaller town centre. But I'm going to leave it there. OK, uh, the next one is how realistic is building 5,500 homes in windfall development without building on back gardens? Because that seems rather a lot to have to find. So that's my next question. Mr Hobbs, you're on. Well... We've allocated sites, uh, we've got sites that show that it's possible to build that number of homes on those sites as shown in the maps and in the documentation in this paper. Can I just add that those 5,500 homes are allocations, the windfall element's 1,800 homes yeah. and then there's a shortfall um, to be found outside the borough later in the plan period. 
yeah, I did know some would be later outside the borough. Okay, so we're quite confident about that. Uh, yes, we are, yeah. And, and at the examination, we'll be tested on the deliverability of those sites, so the inspector will want to see that those sites can actually be delivered in the plan period. Okay, lovely. Um, now going on to jobs, because uh, we feel that this core strategy is a bit more business growth align itself with housing. So I know we're talking about the practical side of where these new jobs might go, but how are we going to attract and encourage new jobs alongside supporting businesses? In terms of planning, the thing that you, sorry, the thing that you do is to allocate employment land. And uh, you know, then it makes clear that sites in the town centre for offices, um, sites at Futura Park for industrial use, which has been, you know, comes there after the um, John Lewis uh, enabling development, if you like, and that, I guess, welcomes businesses, says that we welcome them coming to these sites for these purposes, and hope that's what follows. In planning terms, that's what um, we do. In the planning sure. um, yeah, can I, I'll just add that um, yeah, we, we allocate land for employment opportunities. Um, we also work closely with our economic development colleagues, um, particularly around the economic development strategy. And we're working with the um, New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership as well to um, help implement the strategic economic plan. I love that. Yeah. And of course we have increased the amount of employment land by moving the land, the land of Ravenswood back from uh, provisional housing back to employment land. And yet we turn down Morrison's because we think there's going to be this magic building in this game. Um, okay, my uh, chair, my a last one. A comment, please. I am allowed to make a comment. I don't have to ask. Um, Councillor Jones. Thank you. Uh, that was an application taken at a planning committee meeting chair, where, for quite clear policy reasons, we opposed uh, an out of town centre. Uh, application. Councillor Chenchi talked earlier about the importance of town centre uses, about the importance of bringing people into the town centre and that was exactly the reason that we turned down, the committee turned down the Morrison's application for a site way outside the town centre because there are sites within the town centre where if people were to use a, a Morrison's in the town centre, work in a Morrison's in the town centre, then the economic well-being of the town centre benefits. And it was very clear and it was the right decision. Supported by uh, Ipswich Central in a comment and they, re they represent town centre retailers. Your last question, Councillor Chair. Yeah. Um, the consultation, I think this is a very good report by the way, it's uh, really easy to read, but it's huge and I just wondered whether we could be a bit more proactive because, I mean if I was sitting at home, you know, we're involved in politics and I saw this, I think, where do I start, how do I begin? So I just wondered how we are proactively taking this into schools, I think um, geography, history, students uh, at A level would be quite interested in this, focus groups, that type of thing, just how we, rather than just throw it out there and expect people to look at it. I spent the whole weekend looking at this and didn't finish it, so. Chair, I think it's clear that from the um, consultation, you know, this was, uh, this is the result, isn't it, of the consultation first time round. And we do send it to interested groups like the Northern Fridge Protection Group have responded on, on sites way beyond and issues beyond um, the Northern Fringe. Save Our Country Spaces, developers uh, respond, uh, individuals respond where it's been clear that, uh, you know, th that it's somewhere near uh, where they live or where they work and they're interested. We did take, I can't, we did have a public um, exhibition, I think, Mr. Hobbs, didn't we? public exhibitions, plus we took them to area committees, and we'll do that again. Um, we take to area committees just those sites that are in the locality of the area committee. So I think we really do what we can to uh, bring the bits that are interested, interesting and relevant to local people 
to that local area. I mean, people like developers, it's up to them to have a look and make their responses, and they have. And people like Natural England and so on. I'd like it to go and it's on the website, and you know, we are where we are with this, I think. Mr. Holmes, you want to um, yeah, I, I was, so I'll take that point. We, we have intended to do an executive summary for the consultation to pick out the key points for people to what the main sort of changes are and what the main issues are. Because okay. I, I take one of the things that combined documents are approaching sort of 250 pages. So. Yeah, and what about scores? I still think you could have, we did that once before and it went down really well. When we had some six things, they came, I think they came into the town hall. The difference at this stage of consultation is this is uh, formal representations for the examination. The earlier round was um, inviting comments to change the plan. Um, so I'll take that comment on board and, and think about that. It's an important it's, document and it's mm -hmm. their future. Thank you. That's it. But equally, we wouldn't. I don't think we should be expecting six formers to go and um, speak formally at uh, the planning department. No, no, it's, it's just for them to give us a, their comment. Uh, Chair, there'd be uh, no reason why we couldn't uh, uh, send an email inviting um, geography or economic teachers at our high schools, you know, to check the website. But I think at this stage it is getting this document ready for uh, the formal inspection by the government inspector. I think there was any time for doing this, it would have been earlier on in the, in, in the process. Well, and I, well, I think our officers, you know, have enough to do um, with respect in, in dealing with this and uh, getting it ready for inspection. That's, that's the <coughs> position we're in now. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And going back to Councillor Chenchi's first question. Yeah. I think you mentioned 600 additional affordable homes. How has that number arrived at? I didn't understand. No, it's not like, It's not a scientific thing. It's it's talking about if it was flat rate and you raised the additional houses outside of the garden suburb to 25% instead of 15%, you would have a few hundred more, roughly yeah. five to 600 more houses. Still uh, it's done by floor space, isn't it? So it's not, I haven't sat down with a calculator. But I do know that 15% of all the rest of the houses outside of the garden suburb is going to be a lot less affordable housing than if you have 25% across the board. So uh, we'll be looking Councilman into this in more detail when it goes to council meeting. Uh, I'm looking forward to the detail, Chair, so I'm not making I sense bet you of are, those Councillor Cook. numbers at the moment. Um, and it, it seems to me that that must be including the, the windfall sites that you're sceptical about, Councillor Chen. I didn't, I didn't tell sceptical. You came across as sceptical. No, Councillor Chenchi, do you think you could let Councillor Cook just say what he's saying and then if you want to respond, put your hand up and I'll call you. Councillor Cook. So, yeah, the, the only other point, Chair, I'm not expecting a response to this necessarily, but I'm not sure who Councillor Chenchi thinks is blackmailing. That seems a lot of emotive language. Um, I was a bit that? amused by that. Councillor Smart. Um, I don't know how helpful. Otherwise, this um, might, might be. I think on the question of the affordable housing, um, whether one believes uh, in applying uh, rates, or wh whether one, any, anyone is sceptical or not about um, how many houses might be uh, provided through the, the windfall mechanism um, or opportunity, they are much more likely to be sites where there are uh, fewer than. Um, the qualifying number of dwellings anyway for this whole issue about whether it's 15 or 25 or 35 to come into, into play uh, in any case. Um, I've always felt somewhat frustrated about this whole business about um, affordable housing being done through the planning uh, process. Um, you get housing developments in, I don't know, Guildford or somewhere, and people point to Guildford and say, aren't they wonderful? Look, 40% affordable housing. And of course, what you have to remember is that the, the cost of supplying a house is whatever the proportions are, but let's say they're one third the land acquisition and one third the, um, the building materials and one third the labour cost, whatever that proportions are. We'll, we'll use a third for it. Now, uh, nationally, uh, 
building construction workers wages don't vary enormously uh, across the country in the same way that land prices do or uh, the price at which you can sell the market bit of your housing development which is the thing that, that subsidises the, the, the other bit and similarly with building materials they tend to be sourced at prices that don't tend to vary hugely the tract for the house that you build varies enormously between uh, say Ipswich and say Guildford now it's the same kind of philosophy that looks at the costs and how they're shared. And as has been said, the, the, um, the land at Northern Fringe was originally acquired by somebody at an agricultural land value. And there isn't, although there's quite a bit of demands that we want to make through the uh, planning process, to extract benefits in terms of infrastructure and education and so on. The fact that there isn't land contamination issues, for example, uh, to cope with, like you would with brownfield sites, um, you're starting from a position where you should expect uh, a higher tariff. Um, I think it's therefore, uh, I mean, I, I agree that we, that we ought not to be in the position where we've got to reduce the tariff elsewhere. I'd like to see a flat rate of 35% across the board, never mind 25%, that's what I'd like to see. Um, but of course, far too much weight these days is given to um, developers whimpering about what they can afford and what they can't afford. I mean, you've only got to look at 313 and 314 in the way that it's, it's mm. outlined here. They say, oh, We've got to reduce the affordable housing burden on these sites because of all the other things that we want, like energy efficiency. And in the next paragraph, they haven't got even achieved that either. Um, and, and moving on to the energy efficiency, since my name's been linked with this. I mean, if I was to buy something like a car or a fridge, it's sold on the basis of its energy rating or its fuel efficiency. But when you buy a house, the argument is that all these demands will push up the cost of housing, but not the cost of living in the house, which comes down if they're more fuel efficient. And that leads me to believe that the way in the housing market's become distorted is that so much of it now goes into the hands of people who don't actually want to live there. They want to let the property to some other poor tenant who's then going to have to pick up the, the, the energy bill. Um, so I think that... that we owe it to future generations to go for the highest possible standard um, of energy efficiency. But apparently uh, that, is, that is not the way uh, things are going. I have a certain amount of sympathy with Councillor Chenchi's suggestion about getting stuff into, in, into schools and so on. And in fact, when we've considered planning documents in the past, um, such as the Northern Fringe, um, for example, I was pleased to see in the public gallery um, somebody who I happen to know is a, uh, a lecturer at, um, at Suffolk College and who's actually quite interested in, in getting her students interested in, in, in this kind of stuff. Now, of course, we do maximise the opportunity to try and get um, people involved by extending the period of consultation, having 12 weeks instead of six. I mean, the last thing you want is... a the consultation for six weeks and four weeks of that is when the schools are shut or you know whatever so there is within the within the kind of tolerance envelope that we've got at our disposal the maximum opportunity for people to, uh, to to get involved so yeah i mean by all means look forward to a, a debate later on but um there are reasons why things are as they are um and there's a lot in here that i don't like the direction of where national planning policy is going um, but at the end of the day, someone's going to say whether this is viable or not. Yeah. 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 Mr. Hobbs, I've never prepared this round. Councillor Jones. Next. Uh, can we agree the revised recommendations then to uh, pass this on to uh, Council? Um, so, 16.1, those in favour? 
unanimous. 16.2, those in favour, against. 16.3, uh, those in favour. It's unanimous. Thank you. We could then move on to item 6, adoption of street lane policy, transfer cook. Yes, thank you, Chair. Excuse me, also, thank you. Thank you. This um, paper is coming forward until now. Uh, street naming and numbering has operated very much on, on a principle of, of custom and practice, uh, and uh, in that way for, for many years, certainly as long as I've been a councillor, probably much longer than that. What we're seeking to do here, which I think is good practice, is to, to set out in a structured way exactly what our policy is, the way in which we operate street naming and numbering. Um, it sets out um, you know, particular things like the consultations that we will undertake um, with residents, with developers, with the Royal Mail and others as part of the, the process. I don't really plan to say a lot more on it than that, Chair, except that the proposed policy is at Appendix 1. And, um, Recommendations at 13, and Mr. Bing is here to help if there are any detailed questions. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Want to add anything, Mr. Bing? Are there any comments? No, fairly straightforward. Agree recommendations? Thank you. Uh, item 7 in Councillor Rutkin's absence. Um, I'll take this. Report, um, fairly straightforward report, detailing short-term loans on three sets of objects. Uh, the Dunwich Seal, which was presumably saved from the sea at some point. Um, Tudor, some Tudor carving, carved timbers, um, the Ipswich Maritime Trust, and um, the painting Girl on a Sofa, we know it well. Um, to, uh, to the Holborn Museum uh, in Bath. These are short-term loans. Uh, we have consulted the uh, Friends of Chair of Friendships of the Museum, who's happy with those loans. Um, so I'd like to recommend that we uh, go ahead with them. Mr. Molly, would you like to add anything at this stage? Uh, nothing further to add, Chair, but happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Councillor Chen Chi. Thank you, Chair. Yes, perfectly happy with this. We've, we've got a couple of questions. One, I don't know why we haven't asked it before, actually. Um, how are the uh, items in transit insured, or, or are they insured, um, and, and who insures it, and who pays for that, the transportation? And the other one is more about the Dunnage seal. seems a bit mean not to give it back to them, <laughs> and that on a long-term basis rather than a, than a short-term. So that was just a comment from the shadow portfolio holder. I think it seems mean that we've got their, their seal anyway. Just one. Um, the responsibility for um, all transport insurance and uh, other costs are the responsibility of the borrower uh, for loans. Uh, the slight exception here is uh, in terms of uh, the um, uh, Institute Maritime Trust, where as part of mutual support um, we'll be meeting the costs of transit uh, for those two uh, those two timbers to be uh, taken down to the waterfront um, but as a general rule the rule is that the borrower pays for appropriate costs um, the loans will be accompanied um, by uh, qualified staff but again those costs are met by the borrower um, on the second point um, we have had a, a request for a short-term loan um, I think the Dunwich Museum is, is now fairly safe from the sea being set where it is and they do have appropriate um, conditions so were they to request it for longer then we would bring back a further report for consideration. Well they did lose half their tent so yeah. I don't know whether we could trust them to <laughs> <laughs> lose the sea as well. Councillor uh, Jones. Chair, I think you know it is pointed out by uh, the Chair of Friends that it does give us an opportunity to display other things instead, doesn't it? She suggests painting to the place of uh, the uh, films of uh, the Will Engine. So, and we, we, we get stuff back from other places that we've been to. 
Can we agree, rec agree. agree the recommendations? Yeah. Thank you. And then move on to item 8, amendment to shared revenues partnership agreement. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. Select amendment to um, the shared revenue partnership agreement. Uh, Councillor Haley from Mid Suffolk District Council has chaired the joint committee for two years. And as all joint committee members are very happy for him to continue, uh, we we need to amend the SRP agreement and remove the requirement to rotate the chair every two years. So, um, just to let you know as well that with Suffolk District Council and Labour have already passed the amendment. Uh, I think that was on the 25th and 26th of September, respectively. And therefore, um, all we need to do is to remove the. Uh, the restrictions um, and pass it to the city. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Murdoch. I know from my time on the uh, Shared Revenues Partnership, um, certainly appreciated the, uh, the chairing of uh, Councillor Haley there. Um, <coughs> I think all the members of the committee uh, would be very happy for him to, uh, to continue chairing. Um, don't particularly, I think there is there's a great deal of trust that has been built up between the three partners on the Shared Revenues Partnership, and I think. The sort of safeguards um, that were in place with rotating chairs so that people didn't get, feel left out, I don't think they, they are necessary. Uh, so I'd certainly support uh, removing this restriction so that Councillor Haley could continue his chair. Are there any questions or comments? No, can we agree the recommendation? Agreed. Thank you. Um, uh, item 9. Um, Members of the 